Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Hong Kong Book Fair uh, Open Public Forum. This forum uh, is specially designed to let you, um, the public, through uh, enthusiasm or curiosity or erudition or even ignorance, to ask our distinguished authors questions about writing. Erica Jung, uh, Jung Chang, and William Shawcross, all very good friends of mine, luckily, and to all of them, I want to say my deepest thanks for um, traveling across the oceans to be with us today. And I think that we are all beneficiaries of the interruption of the summer holidays. I'm particularly thrilled to have persuaded Erica and Jung to come because uh, in the past I've not been able uh, to include any female authors, uh, probably through um, gynophobia, which is an abnormal fear of women. <laughs> but I've overcome it. And so today we've got these two extremely distinguished female writers. Do, do, David, do you not think it's perhaps because women have fear of you? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. My wife is eternally defiant. And that's why you like her. So William Shawcross is on his own today as the so male. Yes. <laughs> Although Much I'm very pleased best. to say that the last subject of his biography was in fact a woman, the Queen Mother. Now the format of today's forum is very simple. In a minute, uh, each of our authors uh, is going to say whatever they want to say, whatever they want to read, for about five minutes. And um, I will then open the floor for question. All you have to do is to raise your hand, and I will choose you, and you will ask a question which I hope to be an intelligent question. <laughs> Stupid question will be slammed down. <laughs> but to make it more exciting and encourage you, I have brought here a 1934 edition of Ulysses, which, is a band, which was a banned book. It was published in 1922, but this is nearly a first edition, if not the second one. And a beautiful one. Smells wonderful. And I will give it, in consultation with my panel, to the most intelligent question asked. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> but I might test you on it before you receive it. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank, of course, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, um, the Hong Kong University, where we're going to have another session tomorrow, and the South China Morning Post, the Sing Tao newspaper, for giving their sterling support to this forum. And in particular, I want to thank Agnes uh, Chan over there, uh, who really has been the linchpin of all the organization. And I want to thank you, together with us, for making this possible. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Jack So the chairman of TDC over here, almost incognito, <laughs> for always selling Hong Kong at its best. And I think we've got the best here for you and for all of you tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to ask um, um, each of our authors to say whatever they want to say for five minutes, and uh, thereafter you can think about an intelligent question to ask, and don't forget this wonderful 1934 <laughs> edition of Ulysses, which could be yours uh, before 7.15 or 7.30. <laughs> and, and just two parish notices. Um, if, um, when we finish, outside, our authors will be very pleased to be signing books. Um, and so feel free um, to queue up and buy their books and um, let them sign them. Okay, um, I will 
start with Erica, perhaps first, to say what, ask her to say whatever you want to say to our English, to our sorry, to our Hong Kong audience. Thank you so much, David. I, I'm going to read perhaps a paragraph of the book that made me notorious, and then I'm going to speak a little bit. There were 117 psychoanalysts on the Pan Am flight to Vienna, and I'd been treated by at least six of them, and married a seventh. God knows it was a tribute either to the shrink's ineptitude or my own glorious unanalyzability that I was now, if anything, more scared of flying than when I began my analytic adventures some 13 years earlier. My husband grabbed my hand therapeutically at the moment of takeoff. Christ, it's like ice, he said. He ought to know the symptoms by now since he's held my hand on lots of other flights. My fingers and toes turn to ice. My stomach leaps upward into my rib cage. The temperature in the tip of my nose drops to the same level as as my finger as and my nip as my fingers and my nipples stand up and salute the inside of my bra or in this case dress since i'm not wearing a bra and for one screaming minute my heart and the engines correspond as we attempt to prove again that the laws of aerodynamics are not the flimsy superstitions which in my heart of hearts i know they are Never mind the diabolical information to passengers. I happen to be convinced that only my own concentration and that of my mother, who seems to expect her children to die in a plane crash, keeps this bird aloft. This is the first paragraph of Fear of Flying. I, I didn't read you the stuff about the zipless fuck. But this book is how I got from being a respected younger poet who won all the awards Sylvia Plath and W.S. Merwin won to being the happy hooker of American literature. It's been quite a journey and it's taken 40 years and I've written three historical novels and seven books of poetry and and many other articles and reviews and pamphlets and God knows what. And I have come to understand what it's like to be a woman writer in a world in which women are still looked at as breasts and pussies. So I have learned from my journey that we are absolutely not equal yet. Um, but people are beginning to put us on panels. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Um, what I really like to do here tonight is share some of my poetry with you, but I know we're not allowed to do that because publishing a book of poetry is like dropping a rose petal down Grand Canyon. But um, I want to say that I always wished to be a woman of letters, that my ideals in writing were people like Jonathan Swift and Boswell. I was an 18th century scholar. I didn't want to choose a major in the great graduate school of life, which Americans tend to do. I wanted to write feuilletons, pamphlets, political things, poems, novels, satires, and um, I was a poet who fell into the perhaps bad habit of writing novels. So I do believe that a woman can be a person of letters. And I take great delight at this point in my life, 40 years on after Fear of Flying, of encouraging young women writers and telling them that they can do anything they want to do. And if my work has encouraged young men and young women to write freely about their lives, their feelings, their sexuality, their parents, the, the iron bands that hold them, the things they wish for to make them free, then I feel very lucky and very blessed 
very lucky and very blessed. I, I believe that I was put on this earth to be a communicator. Um, I am a teacher. I love teaching writing and I love encouraging young writers um, to know that they can, they can fly. So that's who I am. And I'm grateful to be back in Hong Kong, a city I absolutely adore. I'm grateful to all of you for inviting me. I'm enormously grateful to Sir David for making it so much fun with his stories and his jokes and wonderful food and wonderful company. So thank you. Brilliant. All right, Yong uh, Chang. <laughs> Well, I, uh, first of all, of course, would l like to thank Sir David and, and the Hong Kong Book Fair for inviting me um, and to talk to a Hong Kong audience. Um, when I, I just feel very, very excited about that. Um, I'll just say a few words about how I became a writer. Um, I was born in China in, in 1952. Um, and I, when I was a child, I always wanted to be a writer. But as I was growing up in China, in mainland China, in the 1950s, 60s, and early part of 70s, it was impossible to become a writer. Um, as you know, you probably all know now. You know, nearly all writers were persecuted, you know, driven to suicide, sent to the gulag. Some were executed, and even writing for oneself was dangerous. In 1966, uh, when the Cultural Revolution started, books were burned across China. And when I wrote my first poem, which is on my 16th birthday in 1968, um, I was lying in bed polishing my poem, and then I heard the door banging, and some red guards had come to raid our flat. So I had to quickly rush to the toilet and to tear up my poem and flush it down the toilet. That, was, that went my first poem. Um, but the idea of writing, the desire to write, never left me. In the following years, I was exiled to the edge of the Himalayas and worked as a peasant and as a barefoot doctor. And then later, I was in a factory working as a steel worker and an electrician. And when I was spreading manure in the paddy fields, and when I was checking electricity supplies on top of the electricity poles, and my mind would always be writing with an invisible pen. And I just couldn't write it, couldn't put that pen on paper. And then in 1973, things got better, and I went into Sichuan University to learn English. But of course, you know, in those days, China was totally closed to the outside world. Our teachers had never spoken to foreigners themselves. So our textbooks were direct translations from Chinese texts. And I remember num um, uh, lesson one was Long Live Chairman Mao, of course. Uh, <laughs> lesson two was greetings, because in those days in China, when we bumped into each other, we say, 吃饭了吗? 上哪去? Which means, where are you going? And have you eaten? And those were the English greetings I learned. <laughs> So I first went to London. I used to go around and ask people where they were going and whether they'd eaten. <laughs> and the only foreigners I spoke to were some sailors in a port in South China, in Zhangjiang, um, where we, as English language students, were sent to practice our English. But of course, as, as far as we were concerned, 
They were our only chance, and we were there only there for two weeks. So we would be eagerly awaiting for our sailors in the only <laughs> bar and the restaurant, and we would grab them as soon as they came on shore. And of course, we had no idea what must be on their minds. <laughs> and then, and in 1976, Mao died, and things began to change. In 1978. For the first time, scholarships for going abroad were awarded on academic basis. I sat for exams, and, and I did reasonably well. So I I became one of the first group of 14 people to go and study in the West. And as far as I know, you know, I I was the only person. I was the first person to get out of Sichuan. Such one province, then of 90 million people, to go and study in the West, and I was so lucky when I got my doctorate in linguistics in 1982. I became the first person from Communist China ever to get a doctorate from a British university.、Um, And、uh, when I arrived in England, and of course I could then write whatever I would like to write, I could fulfil my dreams as a writer. But at that moment, then I lost all desires to write, because suddenly I came to this new world, which is like Mars, and there were so many new things, and I just wanted to absorb. The new life, and I want, just wanted to enjoy myself. Whereas to write would mean to look back and look inward, and to look at、um, some some things I just prefer to forget. And my father and my grandmother both died in the Cultural Revolution, and their death were the most painful spots in my heart. So I just didn't want to think about it, and I wanted to enjoy life. And I had such fun.、Um, when we first arrived, we were not allowed to go out on our own. We had to walk in a group. The 14 of us were all wearing the Mao suit, you know. The blue kind of uniform, and we were quite a sight in the London streets. <laughs> and there were many、um, rules: and we mustn't, we mustn't do this, that, and the other. One particular rule was we mustn't visit an English pub, because <laughs> the Chinese translation for pub, 酒吧 Suggested somewhere indecent, with nude women gyrating, <laughs> and of course I was full of curiosity.、Um, I was、um, torn with curiosity, and I realized that there was a pub just across the road from the college. And one day I sneaked out of the college. I darted across the road, and I pushed the door of the bar open. And of course, I saw nothing of the kind. Some just some old man sitting there drinking beer. <laughs> drinking beer. And I was very, very disappointed. <laughs> and and so I、um, so my life was um, um, I, I did many first first things for people from mainland China, and I didn't want to write the book. But in 1988, my mother. Came from China to visit me.、Um, this is this was her first trip abroad, and for the first time, she told me the stories of her life and the stories of my grandmother and my father. And once she started, she couldn't stop. She stayed with me for six months, and she talked every day. <laughs> and while, while I was listening to her, and I, I said to myself, "I've got to write all this down." And then I suddenly realized, you know, how I wanted to write, and how I, how I, I, I wanted to be a writer. And it was also as though my mother knew that I had this unspoken dream, and my mother was making it possible. For me to fulfil my dream, because when I was out working, my mother would be talking into a tape recorder. So by the time she left, she had left me 60 hours of tape recordings, and I then wrote Wild Swans and became a writer. Thank you very much.、Oh,
And of course, um, that's only half the story because you then went on to write uh, the book of Mao and um, very soon coming out in October. And I think you're coming back to Hong Kong, uh, your new book on the Tao Wei Jia Qi Shi, uh, to which we are greatly looking forward. But um, your story of Lost in Translation reminded me of a great character, uh, Mr. Henry Fock, whose number four wife arrived in England one day for the first time and was interviewed by the immigration officer. She didn't speak very much English, but she understood a little bit. And the immigration officer said, he said, what is the purpose of your visit? And she knew what he was ask, asking. And, um, and he thought, well, um, so I'm just walking, she said. <laughs> So the immigration officer said, why don't you just walk here? <laughs> anyway, Willie Shawcross, your turn. Well, I'm sure you will all agree that it's a typical David Tang dirty trick <laughs> to make me speak after those two brilliant and inspiring and in, uh, speeches by these two fascinating and superb women writers. It's a, it's a method of putting down the man on the desk. <laughs> but David and I have known each other for a very long time, and I was expecting that, so um, I'll have to live with it. Uh, but uh, David's original offer to everybody in this hall, which is a very generous offer, a wonderful copy of Ulysses, for that... The, the 1934. 1934, 1934. I have the 1922. Oh, this is really one... <laughs> I've got two in my, at my home. <laughs> one upmanship, two upmanship, one down, two down. Who's, what am I bid? Anyway, I just wanted to point, David said he's going to, there will be lots of stupid questions, but the best question is going to get that marvellous prize. I would like to say something slightly different. I was travelling with Kofi Annan uh, a few years ago. I wrote a book about him and the UN and the UN's attempts to come to uh, some sort of terms with the horrors of the world. And uh, Kofi used to say, very, very nicely whenever he was in an audience, particularly a student audience. There's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only stupid answers. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I think it's a very encouraging thing. So remember, David, there's every question here is going to be intelligent. So it's going to be very, very hard for you to give this prize. <laughs> and it serves him right, given such a difficult task. Anyway, my journey as a writer is not nearly as interesting and as uh, brilliant as either... Erica's or Jung, so I won't bore you with it for too long. But I, 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 I was going to, I was at Oxford in the 60s and I was going to join the Foreign Office and then I went on holiday in 1968 in Czechoslovakia with my sister, Joanna, and the Russians invaded. I went there because it was interesting, because it was a revolt for freedom against Soviet occupation. And uh, the Czechs were, in, in, in the summer of 1968, amazingly excited at the idea that they could finally liberalize communism and produce what Alexander Dubček, the Czech, Czechoslovak leader at that time, called communism with a human face. And the Russians invaded to crush communism with a human face. And it was immensely emotional. And all the Czechs whom I met in the summer of 1968 with joy in their hearts and songs in their lips lost all that. And I was very much caught up with the emotion of it, and I decided not to join the Foreign Office, but to write a book about Alexander Dubček, the Czechoslovak leader. And I managed to persuade a publisher in London, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, to give me an advance of 50 pounds. <laughs> uh, 50 pounds on signature and 50 pounds if I delivered a publishable book. And 50 pounds in those days was a lot more than it is today. I mean, you could take a ferry with a car to... Uh, across the channel for £10 or £11, I think, and the petrol from Calais to, to Prague was probably another £15. So it, it was an opportunity, and I wrote this uh, biography of Dubček, uh, who was by then under house arrest, or under real arrest, actually, in, in uh, Slovakia, and very few people were brave enough to talk to me, but nonetheless I did what I could and researched it in libraries and in newspaper uh, morgues and so on with the help of a Slovak interpreter and managed to produce this book and it was published the next year and it was, that's how I started. And then subsequently to that, quite soon after that, in 1970, I came to Asia for the first time and to Hong Kong for the first mm -hmm. time. I went um, to Vietnam, which was, as you know, at the height of the war then, um, and uh, after w wandering around, not wandering around, but after trying to 
understand what was going on in Vietnam with the, the American army was still there in full force. And uh, I then came to Hong Kong for the first time in 1970. And as anybody does who comes to Hong Kong who has half a brain, fell in love with the place because it's such a superb, vibrant, and intellectually and emotionally challenging and exciting place to be. And every time I come here, I feel that again. And every time I come here, I think, my God, why is it so long since I came last time? Why have I not been here every year, twice a year? So I'm extremely grateful to David for inviting me to come here to talk to you today. It's an absolute thrill to be here once again. And of course, Hong Kong has changed enormously since 1970, but the changes always seem in character with the freedom and the exhilaration of the place. And I came, one of the crucial visits from my point of view that I came on was in 19, uh, just after the massacre in Tiananmen, when those of you who are old enough will remember there was a huge, there was horror in Hong Kong at what this meant for Hong Kong only six or seven years before the handover. And uh, there were massive demonstrations in Central and there's uh, placards put on the statue in Central, in the, uh, in the square. And it was a very, very powerful moment. And the British government, I thought, behaved very badly in not offering British residents, three million British residents in Hong Kong, immediate visas. Uh, to come to uh, British passport holders to come to live in, in England. And I think we would have done a huge benefit to ourselves, to Britain, to the British economy, as well as to uh, helping Hong Kong and assuage the fear of Hong Kong Chinese that they did have an escape route if they wanted. And I wrote a little pamphlet about it at the time called Kowtow, and it was the British government kowtowing to the Chinese government, which uh, I, and, uh, it was a criticism of both the Chinese governments and the British government, and it's, it's called, the subtitle is called After Tiananmen Square, a plea on behalf of Hong Kong. But I'm glad to say that the worst fears... <laughs> uh, I'm glad to say that the worst fears that people felt here then in 1991, 1990, 1991, 92, were not, I think, realised, uh, and Hong Kong can, has... Well, that's a very interesting point. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd love you to expand on that uh, when, you, when, when, when we come to David managing the questions. That's probably the most intelligent remark made so far. <laughs> is that question? Yes, not yet, question mark. Who, I think who is the man who shouted out? I don't, yes, right, you are a marked man. <laughs> I'm very interested in the stupid answer to come. <laughs> Quite. Sit down. <laughs> this is getting going rather well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> David, this is what you wanted. You want a riot, don't you? You always want to provoke unpleasantness. And I have to say that the problem with a lot of forums and so forth, they're far too serious. But, of course, being uh, witty and, and laughing and, and so forth does not mean that it cannot be serious. So I hope that uh, all of you will have very witty uh, questions and, and intelligent <laughs> questions and so forth to follow. But um, let um, Mr. Shawcross finish off whatever he was well, going I'll to just, say. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come to an end because... <laughs> I, I, after Vietnam, I wrote several other books um, about the Shah of Iran and his fall and about uh, the, the United Nations, as I said, and, and, various, uh, and Rupert Murdoch and the sort of extraordinary revolution in communications we've seen in the last 30 years. And then more recently, the, I was very lucky because the Queen in Britain asked me to write the official biography of her mother, the Queen Mother, who, as you know, died at the age of 101 in, nine, in 2002. And the joy of being an official biographer to a monarch in England after their death is that you have unique access to all their private papers, all the royal family's private papers in the royal archives in Windsor Castle. And it's quite astonishing. And box after box of letters and private papers were brought to me. And the first thing I realized was that she was this woman, Elizabeth Boslan, as she was born, was from the age of 10 a fantastic letter writer with beautiful, beautiful handwriting and a buoyant, optimistic view of the world from childhood onwards. And she wrote adorably and brilliantly and very movingly, particularly during the war. But I'll just, I'll just re read you a couple of paragraphs of things she wrote. This was a letter to Princess Margaret, that she, her daughter, which she wrote in 1958. She said, darling, last week I gave a cocktail party for 200 bishops from overseas. By the time that everybody knows that Prince, the Queen Mother liked a drink or two, though she was never <laughs> drunk, but she loved Dubonnet and gin or champagne, champagne. 
Um, she said once, when you're feeling, feeling down, the only thing to do is to have a sip of champagne and try not to weep. <laughs> a great phrase. I thought of having T-shirts made, made in that, with that slogan. I, I would love one. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you one. <laughs> By the time that eight o'clock came, they were in cracking form. They, tack, they tucked into all the canapes and tossed down martini after martini, especially the American bishops. <laughs> who I'm sure had been entertained on warm sherry for weeks before. <laughs> and then in another letter, on, in similar terms, she wrote to Princess Margaret some years later, uh, when she was traveling in the Bahamas, in British uh, territories in the West Indies, Darling, I always have very bad luck with the drinks. <laughs> Perhaps because I'm considered a frail invalid at the age of 74, I'm always given delicious fruit drinks. <laughs> with so little alcohol that one feels quite sick. <laughs> then I asked timidly if I might have just a very little gin in it, and then too much is poured in, so I have to look, ask for more ice to stop my throat being burnt, being burnt to shreds, and so it goes on. This is usually at government house, of course. <laughs> and just finally, on a more serious note, she, as I said, during the war, she and the king were extraordinarily symbols of uh, uh, the, the, the heart of Britain, and they stayed in London during the Blitz, and uh, they were enormously important to keeping up morale throughout the six years of the war. And in November 1940, she, the Buckingham Palace was bombed, and they were both very nearly killed in the, uh, in the morning, and uh, then they had a had lunch and uh, walked down, went into the east end of London, which had been much, much more badly bombed that and every other day. And she wrote to her mother-in-law, Queen Mary, I really felt as if I was walking in a dead city in East London. We walked down a little empty street. All the houses were evacuated. And through the broken windows, one saw all the poor possessions, photographs, beds, just as they were left. At the end of the street is a school which was hit and collapsed on the top of 500 people waiting to be evacuated. About 200 bodies are still under the ruins. It does affect me so, seeing this terrible and senseless destruction. I really mind it much more than being bombed myself. The people are marvelous and full of fight. One cannot imagine that life could become so terrible. We must win in the end. We must win a real peace, not a Nazi peace. Mm -hmm. So, as you see, I think she's a good writer. And that's mm -hmm. been a great joy for me, writing that over the last few years. And now I have to think of something else to do. But thank you for very much for this. <laughs> Lovely. She's so good. She's so good. I always admire her. Well, now you see the um, richness of the landscape of our authors. So, at your own peril, raise the first question. <laughs> Who wants to ask the first question? Not that bald man. Who are you? Where, where is it? Oh, yes, right at the back. Yes. Can I, can I ask a question of Ms. Chang? Mm -hmm. I want to know what question you hope that somebody might ask you. <laughs> that very, is... good, very intelligent question. Can, can, I, just, can, can, I, just make, uh, can I just make a, a, a sensible suggestion? As we are only here for an hour or so... Who is in charge? I'll throw you out in a minute. <laughs> I'm in charge, all right? I'm just telling you that you should not pose the question to one singular author because that's rude to the other two, if nothing else. So why don't you try again and ask your question, which in this case is so universal and generalized that it could have easily applied to the other two, you stupid man. Right. Okay. I would like to answer that question. No, one minute, one minute. Young <laughs> first. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you stupid woman. <laughs> oh, well, I, 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 again, as, um, I think, uh, sorry, David, if I may disagree and agree with um, um, Willie, um, that I think all questions are interesting. I mean, you know, sort of questions one once asked. So I, I don't mind whatever questions people ask, because you must always have something interesting to say. But of course, the question I most wanted you to ask, but I don't want you to ask, is <laughs> what have you discovered 
that is new about Mao. Um, and mm -hmm. because we worked, my husband worked for 12 years, and we discovered mm -hmm. so many things, and we, we have, um, you know, changed so many views. Okay, let me your, be your vicarious okay, wish. What not, is the I'm one thing you us. wanted uh, that you uh, discovered about Mao that made you <laughs> most... Um, yes, it shocked me most. Shocked me, yeah. shocked me most. Yeah. Well, the, sh the thing that shocked me most was um, to, to do with this great famine. I mean, I'm sure I'm, uh, most of you have heard of this now. Between 1958 and 1961, some 40 million people died of starvation and, and overwork. And I, you know, when I was writing Wild Swans, I thought the famine was the result of mismanagement. And Mao was no good at running the economy. And the regime story was, of course, bad weather um, or, you know, other things that don't make sense. But from working in the archives, we realized that actually the mon this amount of people dying, 40 million people dying, was actually part of Mao's economic plan because his ambition ever since he took power in China was to conquer the world. And uh, to fulfill this ambition, he wanted to build um, a world-class, you know, the most giant military industries, the nuclear technology and equipment and missiles and so on. And he bought this from Russia. And what did he have to pay for these expensive purchases? His answer was food. So Mao knew his people were dependent on dependent on this food for survival, but he exported them to Russia. And, um, and, and, and he said, you know, um, a peasant, educate the peasant to eat less, um, having only tree leaves to eat, so what? Um, you know, um, things like, um, uh, oh, for all his projects to take off, half of China may well have to die. Death have benefits, they can benefit the, the land. So in many places, corpses were, in the, you know, people's bodies were buried in the land, and the corpses were grew on top. And I was, um, I must say, I was very shocked. I knew Mao was bad, but I didn't know he was that bad. You know, China's atomic bomb was detonated in 1964, and the bomb was made during the famine. And from all these archives, I won't go into detail, that, I mean, China's food export data and so on. And, I mean, if that, all this money that was paid to Russia and Eastern Europe were, were, were not, um, the food was not exported, but was used to feed his own people. Not a single person in China would have to die. I was very shocked. All right, Erica, your turn. What is the question you would like to have been asked well, most? Well, I'm, I'm circling back to James Joyce, who is one of my favorite authors. And he said in a letter, I think, um, chance provides me with whatever I need. And he talked about taking a walk after a morning of writing, and he would find something, a shoelace, a bottle cap, this was when he was working in Paris, that would unlock the next part of the book. And I think that really tells a great story about the writer's process. You, everybody is interested in the writer's process, but nobody wants to really hear the answer. And the answer is that we don't really know where the initial inspiration comes from. There can be a line that then becomes a poem, that then becomes a novel. We don't really, it's quite mysterious where this comes from. It may come from a dream that you had the night before. If you want to write, you should always keep a little notebook of lines, of dreams, of snatches of conversation overheard somewhere because you never know where the next poem, book, essay will come from. And you have to be always alert to it. But what Joyce says is very, very interesting to me. When you're written out, when you've done everything you can imaginatively for that day, and then you go to exercise your legs, 
and in your head you're trying to solve the problem the book has created for you. And I always think of Joyce saying, chance gives me what I need. He was a minute observer of the details of life. He was a great observer and hearer, listener of conversation. There are whole parts of Ulysses that sound like his wife, Nora, speaking. Molly Bloom, Nora, they are, he morphs uh, Nora into Molly Bloom. And of course, Molly Bloom is also himself in, in Ulysses. So to be a writer means to be ever looking, listening, and filling your mind and your notebook with the strangeness and marvelousness of reality around you. Nobody ever asks that question of a writer. They never say, when they say, how do you write? They say, well, is it the morning? Is it the night? Are you wearing a t-shirt? Are you wearing pajamas? All of which doesn't matter. What matters is how do you catch what's going on in your dream life, in the unconscious, in whatever you want to call it, how do you catch it and how do you write it down so you don't lose it? And where do those things come from? We don't know. It's quite mysterious uh, for a poet and a novelist and a short story writer, etc., an imaginative writer. Um, it's true also of my colleagues who have written memoir and nonfiction that certain subjects are fascinating to you and others not at all. How do you see, is when I teach writing, I tell my students that we all begin by imitating the writers we love, all of us. I was writing Nabokovian pastiches throughout my 20s because I thought Nabokov was the greatest writer. I don't think so anymore. But what I, what I have to say is that we all start out imitating and wanting to, I wanted to be Oscar Wilde or George Bernard Shaw when I was a teenager or perhaps William Butler Yeats. Um, we imitate, but there comes this moment when what we have to say and want to say fuses at a white heat with the voice we were meant to write in. If you can write in the voice in which you speak, you're way ahead of the game. And most young writers can't. But you keep on, you keep on till you find that distinctive voice that sounds like nobody else. And it doesn't matter if you're in your pajamas, at a desk, standing up, lying on the grass, whether it's morning, whether it's night, none of that matters. But the most important thing for any writer is to access that dream life that feeds the work. Good. Uh, really <laughs> I hardly think that was a stupid answer. But there it is. <laughs> now, I, you, you, I, you, you answered the question, the hypothetical question, what is the question that you would most well, I'm not going to give a stupid answer asked. because I can't possibly follow those two answers. Yet again, it's the lame duck syndrome. Um, I, I would like to be asked, or I'd like to discuss in this hall, uh, the question which I don't understand, but the gentleman who, um, who, who David welcomed so kindly <laughs> with his remark, not yet. Um, I would like that to be a question. Is not yet true? Or, I mean, uh, it, does Hong Kong still have anything to fear from incorporation in uh, the Middle Kingdom. And I, I, I don't know the answer to it because I don't live here and I don't come here enough and I hope that many of you will have an answer to it. I mean, I, I would like to carry on from what Jung said and I think her book was an enormously important book on Mao. I first went to China, in, I was very lucky, in 1974 once and then in 1975. Uh, a very small trip with my father and my sister again, um, invited by the Chinese government because my father was quite a well-known lawyer and, and uh, banker in England. 
And um, it was an extraordinary trip to both of them because we, would, we traveled in this tiny little party and uh, to places where very few people had gone at that stage. It was only two years after Nixon's visit and uh, which had opened up China and people were still completely unknown. And uh, the China was still completely unknown. And in Shanghai, I don't think there was any building above 10 stories high. And, and everyone was in the same blue suit that Jung was so <laughs> glamorous in in London. And uh, it was quite extraordinary. It was the time of the Lin Biao Confucius campaign. And it was a very, very rigid and nasty in a way. One had that feeling it was what, that uh, everything was controlled and our guides were frightened. And uh, the liberation of China, the semi-liberation of China that has happened since Deng Xiaoping is quite, a, and after the death of Mao, is quite astonishing to me. The, 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 and just coming to Hong Kong now uh, for the last 24 hours, you, one feels as I've always felt in Hong Kong, but the vibrancy of the marriage between the, the freedoms of Hong Kong and the might and force of China is quite astonishing. And I, I hope I can come again to try it, because this seems to me to be one of the places in the world uh, that one must, if anyone you know, in the West, try to understand better, and I don't understand it nearly adequately enough. So um, I'd like someone to give me an idea of what to write about next so that I can understand it better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Another intelligent question. Yes, the, 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 the man for the beard. Oh, yes. Oh, I just shaved this morning. Oh, you, <laughs> you look equally dark between your face and your, and your jaw. Perhaps in this light. Um, my question is for Mr. Shawcross. Um, it, so the two books that you have on the table are of two people who have... Um, really given public opinion a lot of voice uh, in very different ways between the Shah and the Queen Mother. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what comes to mind to me is the Shah's extravagant uh, like celebrations at Persepolis and then the Queen Mother sort of refusing to leave Buckingham Palace during the war. So I was, you know, thinking, like, to what extent do you allow public opinion to influence the biographies that you write? Uh, are you, do you like totally shield yourself from it and just look at the primary sources? Or do you talk to other people? Do you get their input? And, you know, like biography, I always think is like fact, like this is what this person did, this is what that person did. But as I've read more and more biographies, I see that they're more like a story. So I was wondering, like, does that story come from just you and what you read? Or is it like more encompassing than that? Well, the, the, I think it must be more encompassing than that is the short, short instant answer. Um, but I think that, I mean, these are very different tasks. The, the official biography of the Queen, as I mentioned, uh, the Queen Mother, I was invited to do by the Queen, and that's an extraordinary honor. I suddenly got a letter one day at home saying, from her private secretary saying, uh, would you, the Queen has asked me to invite you to write the official biography of her mother, which was... Um, I, I had asked my name to be put into the hat, but I didn't expect it to be ch taken out of the hat in that way. So it was a wonderful thing. And as, as I said, you had total access to all the royal family's private papers. So that was just a gift, in a way, that I was given that. The Shah was a different story because I knew in the 1960s, one of the Shah's ambassadors in London, a very flamboyant figure called Adashir Zahidi, who was a great friend of my parents when I was a young man, and he used to invite me in this, as a sort of 18-year-old to his private parties at the embassy where he always had very, very beautiful girls. <laughs> and so I very much enjoyed these parties, and I thought <laughs> um, I was very lucky to meet these wonderful people. Um, and, uh, and then I, I was interested in Iran, and you're quite right, the Persepolis celebrations in 1972 were the sort of beginning of the fall of the Shah because they showed his detachment from the country. Rather, a, a complete opposite, if you like, to the monarchy in Britain, which has always managed to retain its links to the country and to change itself in order to retain consent. And that's why the Queen is probably more popular now than she ever has been. The Shah became divorced from the reality of his country and uh, sort of em embraced this uh, absurd sort of uh, um, um, massive expenditures on himself and his family and um, uh, sort of giganticism, if you like. But he was not, until that stage, he was not a bad ruler, I think. He'd, uh, in the 1960s, he'd um, implemented massive, uh, substantial agricultural reforms and improved the conditions of women greatly, and his fall in 1979 was perhaps 
inevitable, well, no, it was not inevitable, but it was certainly a tragedy for Iran. And whatever the excesses of the Shah's regime and the Savak secret police under his rule, they were nothing to the horrors that have followed under the rules of the Ayatollahs. I think the 1979 revolution is probably one of the most important, certainly the most important since the Chinese revolution in 1949. And the Ayatollahs have unleashed a decade, several decades of terror on their own people and on the world. And I was interested to see what the, Shah, the relationship of the Shah and his allies, and he'd been a sort of linchpin of the Western world for 37 years. And then after he fell, he was kicked around the world like a flying Dutchman until he died. But, and I have followed the sort of the, the, the story of Islamism, uh, which is unfortunately not ended yet ever since that, because the, 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 the the role of the Ayatollahs in the revolution of 1979 is crucial to everything, all the other problems that have followed ever since, including 9-11. Okay. Uh, in fact, that, 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 that question obviously can apply to uh, Yun Chang. So um, perhaps you might want to answer part of that question, if not, not the whole well, of it, about your subject <laughs> as a biographer. Yes, well, I mean, I'm of course, with the biography of Mao, we, we, my husband and I were co authors. We were not nearly as lucky as Willie. It doesn't <laughs> happen we, very often. <laughs> we, we had to spend 12 years digging out every bit of information, you know, under layers and layers of, uh, of um, a cover. Um, but um, of course, that's part of the fun as well, um, yes. you know, to, to, to dig out these bits of info, to grab to see this um, um, jigsaw puzzle fall into place. I mean, I, uh, we nearly got a uh, commissioned biography from Imelda Marcos. <laughs> 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 this, uh, some uh, wonderful friends in Hong Kong actually introduced us to Imelda. I mean, by the way, we interviewed you know everyone who had interesting dealings with Mao, and our friends provide gave us this introduction to Imelda Marcos. Um, and Imelda had a very flirtatious relationship with Mao. When he met Mao, you know the thousands of pairs of shoes, lady. Yeah. Um, and when, he, when she met Mao, Mao was nearly blind, but his eyes sparkled when, <laughs> when he saw this figure wearing glorious, uh, you know, clothes and hairdo. And, um, and, and Mao then got into a very flirtatious mood and kissed her on the hand and all these things that would get one condemned in the Cultural Revolution. And this was 1974. Um, so Mao's photographer was so nervous, he didn't dare to take a photograph. But the newsreel camera was rolling and recorded this moment of a rapt Mao kissing a, a tearful Imelda's hand. <laughs> uh, and so... Um, and so we, uh, we, inter we interviewed um, Imelda Marcos, and uh, she, she was in full flow for five hours. <laughs> And, um, and she also, she sort of batted her eyelids furiously at John, my John. Uh, and, um, and then she said to me, um, uh, a Western men simply don't understand us Eastern women. Um, so John said, have you come across any Western men who understand you? She said, only one person, Richard Nixon. Oh, God. <laughs> And then she sort of more flattery to us, and she said she can see this is a, team, a perfect team, John and me, the Western intellect <laughs> and the Eastern heart. So I have the oh Eastern heart. And so she said maybe um, after a biography of Mao, we would like to consider writing about another third world leader. <laughs> but of course, after a biography of Mao came out, we heard no more. From <laughs> Just think that you might have had full access to her shoes. Right. <laughs> she power she corrupts, yes. absolute power corrupts absolutely. But uh, Erica, that if you, if you had to write a, a biography, you, are not, you haven't written a biography, have you? But if you had to write a biography, uh, whom would you choose? I 
I have great interest in one particular female painter um, who was best friends with Marie Antoinette, and her name was Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. And uh, actually, I'm considering writing a novel about her. Uh, she was a consummately good portraitist. She, her drawing was marvelous. But she also had great good luck in her life. Um, she was best friends with Marie Antoinette, and Marie Antoinette was quite unpopular in 1789, as you remember. Uh, <laughs> we just celebrated Bastille Day, so I'm thinking of this. And this wonderful young woman painter who had become a very famous painter, painting the aristocracy of the Ancien Regime, um, she, of course, had one of these 18th century husbands who gambled away all of her earnings, which were considerable. She also, he also spent her considerable earnings on various mistresses, which was considered normal in the 18th century in Europe. But she also had great good luck because in 1789, she got into a carriage with her little daughter, Julie, and left Paris, going to Rome, before the revolution became a reign of terror. From then on, and of course, Marie Antoinette lost her head, and uh, there, the revolution went on and on and on, and the revolutionaries turned on each other, as they always do, and killed each other, and guillotined each other, and the streets flowed with blood, but she went on to Rome where she studied Renaissance painting and then she became a court painter in Moscow to the czars and eventually she wound up in Britain where she painted the court and after this long, long life of survival, um, she came back to France eventually and discovered that her style of painting was completely out of fashion and was derided and mostly forgotten as a painter. Now, because of the women's movement of the 70s, people are beginning to rediscover her. How much? What? How much each painting? <laughs> I don't know what she goes for, but she's I'm a... Just, I'm just following the standard kind of question in, but in Hong Kong. she is... <laughs> how much? <laughs> she, is, she is fascinating to me because... She lived through all the travails of an 18th century woman um, and yet survived and painted yeah. and painted. The only trouble with writing on somebody obscure is that you won't, it won't become a bestseller, perhaps. More, more, it will more, under more. Erica's or, or, No, but yeah. I have never written for money. I write from my Why heart. Why not? <laughs> You're very lucky. Um, I write what I'm I need. Only following what the I, line of questioning in Hong Kong. <laughs> when I, because I truly believe that we cannot predict future taste that if we follow what we really are interested in, sometimes we're lucky and we have a huge hit, and sometimes the audience isn't interested, but I don't think... You have you sold millions of copies. Are you rich? <laughs> uh. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Probably not. You know, they well, figured out every I way not to pay authors. The money is put to a very good use. <laughs> Well, I think your wild, earrings well, sparkling. I mean, without wild swans, we, my husband and I would not have been able to spend 12 years doing nothing, well, except working on Mao. Um, Excellent. So. Okay, th uh, another question, please. Yes, um, um, yes, uh, Rupert. Is it Rupert? Uh, well, you're a fatter version of him. Right. <laughs> Um, the title says, How, What, and Why Do Writers Write? But how do you get over writer's block? What sort of disciplines do each of you have when you, you've got a project? You're right, stop. Through. One minute. Every year we get this uh, stupid question. <laughs> so I'm going to ask somebody else. I mean, it's such I'll a stupid question. Now. Next one. <laughs> You're not going to win that book. Right, can, I, can I ask an intelligent question? Have you ever met an ent a more entertaining and aggressive host than David? <laughs> no, because of course people have writer's block. Of course different people respond different ways. So I'm going to uh, override that question. No, let's see whether the ne next one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, without the jacket. Yeah, who? 
Is it a woman? Good. Let's have a woman. We need a woman's question. Yeah, we need a woman. Stand up. Stand you up. You need a woman, David. <laughs> woman, stand up. <laughs> Very polite. Just shout it out. If you, oh, yes. Uh, that doesn't work. Hi, because um, I'm a journalism student, um, I have a question to Mr. Shawcross. Um, I'm really curious about um, your experience as a broadcaster as well, and which one do you think, um, by being on TV or publishing your own book, is more efficient or effective, on, effective in um, communicating with the public or sharing your own thoughts? Well, TV, obviously, you reach many, many more people. I mean, a book, if you have the sorts of books I write, if you um, reach a few thousand people, you're very, very lucky. Uh, Jung and uh, Erica have happier experience of reaching millions of people by their books. Um, and I wish I could find a subject um, that w enabled me to do that. But uh, television reach reaches a much broader audience, but it's much more superficial. And actually, of the, th of the, the, the nice medium in between is radio. Radio, yes. you can talk very much more intelligent. Well, I don't want to say I'm intelligent, but you can talk it much more <laughs> discursively uh, than you can on television. Television tends to be sound bites, and radio isn't always that bad. Mm. But I enjoy writing books. But I also, I like making films, because it's fun going out with a film crew and seeing strange things and doing uh, meetings for fun. That's, I would like mm. to say that as a result of one of your biographical subjects, Mr. Murdoch, the level of television has plummeted in <laughs> London and New York. I don't agree with that. <laughs> oh, okay, but in America we have the Kardashian sisters who are famous principally for their big butts. And Kim Kardashian came to the public's attention by doing a video of herself having sex with an extremely handsome black man. And this is the way people now get famous on television. And nobody who writes books has a prayer in that world. It's very sad for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. Yes, uh, another lady, a blonde lady. David, don't say anything rude, okay? <laughs> I'm sure. I know. <laughs> is this she is Austrian. Be careful. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, we're a very mild ma nation. Anyway, um, Mr. Shawcross, you okay. asked our opinion, or Hong Kong's opinion, on the fear when the gentleman up there said, not yet. Mm -hmm. And I have lived in Hong Kong for over 50 years. My husband is Chinese. And I'm certainly no authority on the situation that we are facing, perhaps, I don't know, in um, when, 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 um, we go back to China as 50 years of given leave. But I think Hong Kongers are not so much afraid of what China might do to Hong Kong. But I think China is very afraid how Hong Kong's ideas and spirit of independence and, and defiant um, stands mm. on certain issues I think that's what um, will perhaps be difficult to answer. We don't know what China might do to Hong Kong to stop us from our independent voice. Well, that's fascinating. And, and, and Erica said before when we were talking in a smaller group that freedom is contagious. And uh, a few minutes after that, I was interviewed by a very clever young woman from the South China Morning Post called Andrea Chen who's come from Beijing to work here for the South China Morning Post. And I think the infectious nature of Hong Kong is irresistible. And that's what's so marvelous about this place. And I'm sure you're right that it will have an effect on China and that uh, the, the nature of communications and digital communications are such that governments can never, never, never again hope to impose the massive control of information that was done by Stalin or by Mao. It's just that era is past. So I agree with you. I think Hong Kong is on the winning side. Do you think mm -hmm. that um, Hong Kong has a great deal of hope? Uh, well, I mean, yes. I mean, Hong Kong's freedom. I mean, well, of course, Hong Kong publishes my books, and, uh, <laughs> which are banned. <laughs> which is on the... I mean, we, um, 
Uh, and yes, and the, but of course it is also true that this freedom is being constantly eroded, um, and, um, um, and 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 that up to a point uh, is actually determined by Beijing, and Beijing doesn't want to be very heavy-handed on Hong Kong because it was looking at Taiwan. It wants to bring Taiwan back, and. Um, and, and so if once they bring Taiwan back, I'm not sure Hong Kong, uh, we can be, always be optimistic um, what's going to happen to Hong Kong. Uh, well, this sounds may very I, may depressing. May I just add one thing? Everybody talks about the freedom of the Internet. And it is true that you can get out a lot of ideas on the Internet. It's also true that governments can spy on all their citizens more efficiently. So we have two tendencies sort of fighting with each other. One yeah, is the sure. flow of information over the internet on blogs and all kinds of different organs of communication. And the other thing is we have recently learned that our governments are spying on us quite as efficiently perhaps more efficiently than Mao ever spied on anyone. Oh, well, that's... So uh, we are, we are paying <laughs> taxes in the United States to a government that is collecting all our emails and letters. And now we discover it's also happening in Britain. So which of these sides will win? Well, we don't know the future. You know, the Oracle of Delphi proved we cannot know the future. I think, to be fair, yeah. they are only collating the um, traffic. They, they, they don't read the content. And in fact, uh, you do need to have special permission to, to read. But, but, but perhaps I can go back to the it's principal right. point about uh, freedom uh, to writers. I mean, obviously, banned books have been, uh, has always happened. I mean, Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China, he burned all the books. Uh, but uh, China is no poorer for it today. And of course, there are, there are lots of books which are banned. You collect banned books. And, um, and perhaps you might say a couple of things about banned books, where, in fact, books are not being able to, public, to be published. Well, I mean, the book that you started out by talking, talking about, uh, Ulysses, 1922, was a book that people had to buy in Paris in an edition from the Olympia Press and bring in their suitcase to other parts of the world. It wasn't permitted to be published. Um, there was a very long legal battle. Uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover was published in a tiny edition in Florence, D.H. Lawrence. Um, you couldn't bring explicit sexual material into the United States for many, many years. And then through a, a long series of cases, you could finally bring Tropic of Cancer, Lady Chatterley's Lover, etc. And it was, it was after the freeing of these books from censorship, which pretty much happened in the 60s um, in the US, that writers like John Updike and Philip Roth began to write about the sexual side of life from a man's point of view. Couples by John Updike was published in 1970. Portnoy's Complaint was published in 1969. I started to read these books by men talking about their inner lives, cutting open their brains and showing their sexual fantasies. And I thought, I could do that from a woman's point of view. It would be different. And, but it would show the other side of humanity and the way women think. Um, so very much it was the change in the laws that permitted a series of very important court cases, which I won't go into here, but that made it possible for us to write about a side of life that has motivated people for centuries, i.e. the sexual side of life, and suddenly we could write about it. And that is why Fear of Flying was published in 1973. Well, Erica, I, you, is, I, is, can I, what you think? I mean, I, you can't simply can't compare the U.S. monitoring on on the internet with the mouse kind of a control. 
I mean, I think the, the basic ingredients with uh, Mao's country, and to some extent which is still there in China today, is the accompanying terror. Yes, and absolutely. what's going to happen to you if the government knows what you are writing, what would be Mao's time? I mean, you know, well, you, 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 you probably everybody here knows that. I mean, you know, you, you get cast in the, to, the, to the gulags, you get executed, all your letters... You know, we don't, don't need to even to compare to Mao's time. But I mean, even today, I mean, the Chinese internet is not just yeah. being monitored. People can be sent to prison for what they wrote, not for what they write, not because of the, their terrorists, but because their their opinions. And, and of course, and also what one, the, the internet control in China is doing is you, they can delete, I mean, my books, I mean, I know this for certain because my books, there are many, many versions um, uh, on the internet initially, but they have all been deleted. And of course, there are also pirated editions. I mean, in my case, I know you're, I welcome pirated oh, editions. <laughs> But, but you people can be put to pr into prison. I, mean, I myself, I sat in, the in front of a computer in London, and I saw a, 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 a comment um, of, uh, on, on our biography. And then suddenly a box appeared, and it says, this item is subject to editorial examination. And a second later, the whole thing disappeared. Um, so I'm there not, is a difference. I'm not saying that it's comparable in, in degree. I'm not saying that okay. at all. Yeah. I'm yeah, only degree. saying degree, yeah. that once the means exist for surveillance, yes. sooner or later they're used. Just as once people build certain kinds of weapons, sooner or later they find an well, excuse to use them. Well, that's well, not we know, true. We know, 1984. Well, um, it, it can be true. We don't know yet if somebody will release... Okay, one minute. Bomb, okay, mistake, okay. We've or... got to have another question now. Yeah. Uh, yes, that, sh that hand shot up very quickly. Uh, another lady. I wanted to bring the conversation back to writing and um, publishing. You just asked the question. <laughs> well done. Um, <laughs> I was wondering how do you see, you, you all worked uh, as writers for a really long time. How has publishing changed in the last 30, 40 years? Is it different now to publish a book compared to 30 years ago? Has ch publishing changed, um, Erica? I, the question puts me to sleep. Yes. Uh, publishing <laughs> has changed actually <laughs> drastically. Um, when, I, when I first published... Publishers used to publish poetry and biography. They don't anymore. If you have a biography or a book of poems, you go to university press. I was first published as a poet in 1971 and 1973. Um, the commercial publishers have given up every pretense of being um, uh, preservers of our cultural heritage. They give the most money to television performers who, um, you know, get naked on the internet. And <laughs> poetry can go hang itself. But they give a lot of money to people who write books with lots and lots of sex in it. No, not really. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> not really. If you're a literary writer and you don't turn out the same sausage every time, they're quite suspicious of you. They like to read reports on how many copies each book sold. That but is absolutely, that, it has become saying. much more commercial. But th the publishers in America, at least, are so frightened of digital books that, and they don't know whither, you know, and when it's going where, that they use it as an excuse to do nothing, okay? So it's gotten much, much harder to publish good books. However, I believe, that human beings are storytelling creatures. And we understand our lives through narrative. And whether we're sitting in a cave telling each other stories, whether we're Aesop making up fables, if he ever existed, or whether we're reading a book on a digital device, 
or a paper device or a scroll. I think we are narrative-making creatures and we like to tell stories. And I don't think it matters a wit or a jottle whether we do it on paper or digitized. And I think everybody's in a fit about it. And it's really a non-issue to me. Publishing, has it changed? Oh, I, I, I have God. nothing fresh to contribute. So well, because it takes you 12 I'm years to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's also true, yes. All right. That was a reasonably good question, but it won't win the book. All right, let's have a... Can I, can I interject yes, yes. just this? I think publishing has changed enormously, and uh, it's much more difficult, as Erica says, to, for lots of small writers, to be, young writers to begin. It's much harder. Publishers have, publishing may have become more commercial, but that's because publishing, as we knew it and as we grew up with it, and that was a golden age of publishing as far as yes, I'm concerned, has gone. And it's gone because of the digital world, and publishers are frightened. Of course, they're frightened of e-books, and they're frightened, above all, of Amazon. And my great fear is that in 20 years' time, the only publisher will be Amazon. And well, the, no, no, no. I, I think, think that's so. a really, really... I hope I'm wrong. Well, I can't, uh, I one hope minute, I'm wrong. one minute. Walking so, through well, this... One at a time. One, one at a time. It's not the true. publishers but, are yeah. publishing book on e-book as well. Yes. I know in, for my case, I mean, or, and, and others, my publishers are publishing the e-book simultaneously. Yes. So, so it may be right. let's hope it's all right. And, and by the way, they're Amazon. making a fortune, but they tell the writers they're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, all right, okay. Um, Victor Chu. <laughs> Don't look around, you are Victor. <laughs> uh, we need a microphone for... Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, private letters have been the main source for biographies in the past, but people are writing less and less letters in favour of emails. How would biographers, uh, how would that impact if you were to write the biography in 10, 20 years' time? Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be much, much more difficult. I mean, for example, just to hop on, if you forgive me for a second, about the royal family. Um, Prince Charles writes long, long letters like his grandmother did, but his son, Prince William, is never, I don't believe writes letters at all, he sends emails and texts. And uh, that's going to be impossible to, for biographers, and it's going to be a huge loss, not just in the royal family, but everywhere. I think it's the letters are, have been crucial to us, and it's going to be very hard to trace texts and uh, um, emails in the same way. But um, didn't, are we not um, hearing that all our emails have been stored <laughs> somewhere? Very good point. <laughs> in which case... It's much easier. I think you print out your emails, you autograph them, and you keep them in a file. Do you do that? Uh, in no, fact, you, you, can, you, can, you can No, no, no. The, in them. fact, you can never get rid of whatever yes, you write. That's true. Uh, that's the frightening thing. You can delete as much as you want, but actually, I, that's there. right. There's when, when, there. cyberspace in perpetuity. When, when emails began, whatever it was, 20 years ago, I said to an American friend of mine, uh, it's really rather a wonderful, new, flirtatious, romantic medium, isn't it? You can communicate rather lovely thoughts. And he said, William, you must be insane. I would not write in an email any words that I did not wish to appear on my tombstone. Yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> Very good advice. Right. All right. Um, uh, uh, yes, there's several. Uh, no, th th that bald man will have to wait a minute. Because uh, <laughs> how about this woman with the flaming hair? Yes. Yes, the, the blonde with... Huge mane. <laughs> Do you think that exile, whether self-imposed or not, uh, provides the best environment or the best sort of manure for uh, the fields of a writer's imagination? Gosh. Ex Young exile. Me. Uh, and, well, I think not necessarily. There, there are great writers in China um, who write and who need the soil to, to, uh, to write. And I, I feel if I, I was in China still, I would still be writing, uh, you know, but of course provided that I can write without getting into uh, uh, no, terrible trouble. Um, I, I don't think exile is a necessary ingredient for writing. But there is, it's also true, it's also with music. Yeah. I mean, you know, there is, exile does bring out um, a certain sentiment 
um, a certain yearning, um, a certain, um, uh, you know, people being, uh, home, you know, homesickness, uh, certain things that, uh, that adds a certain dimension to writing. Mm -hmm. Erica? We can go back to James Joyce, who can never be published in his own country, um, who was banned and burned in his own country, who lived in Paris, who lived in Trieste. Um, I think that we've seen that exile sometimes is a great inspiration for writers. Oh, really? Uh, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. I think some writers feel they need to be nourished by their own lands and customs. So I think it can be both. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Well, other things like tango. The tango was invented in um, Argentina by the lower classes, sneered at by the bourgeoisie and the upper classes. But when it became very famous in Paris, um, it, it, um, mm -hmm. it, got, it got embraced back. Like, I thought the tango was invented by your family. Uh, yes. <laughs> No, my family is the Tang Dynasty. <laughs> Another one. Yes, okay. You, uh, let's have a, a young man with sh shirt sleeves. Yes. Hi. Um, I guess this question is inspired by um, this year's guest list and, well, the recent publishing of J.K. Rowling's book. Uh, well, indeed, gender is fluid sometimes. Um, I'd like to ask if, uh, if the speakers... Uh, can share their joy and experience of writing um, from their gender roles. From their what? From their gender what? Gender roles? From, from their what? Profiteroles? <laughs> 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 what about for profiteroles? Gender roles. Gender roles. Ge from gender roles? What? Gender. From the, from the gender roles. From their gender. Oh. From, from the, the gender. So, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, so you're Jen referring to J.K. Rowling's uh, pseudonym uh, as a man. J.K. Oh, right. yeah, yes, yes, he was referring to whatever his name is. Yes, I think so. Yeah, do you actually, have you ever written under a pseudonym and a male no. one? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not writing novels. I write uh, uh, biographies and autobiographies. Um, and, but, but there is, uh, I think, gender does come into the, uh, one's writing. And if I may slightly tell this story, which is also to do with Hong Kong, which is um, we were doing research, um, Mao, um, and um, we, then we were in Hong Kong. My husband and I were in Hong Kong in a hotel. Uh, and one morning, uh, my husband was in the bathroom reading his South China Morning Post. And, <laughs> and he shouted, he said, David, guess, you have something to say about that. <laughs> guess who's in this hotel? Um, I said, who? He said, it's Mombuto. Do you know, I mean, you might remember, some of you might remember like this, this, uh, this uh, tyrant of Zaire, now yeah. Congo, Mombutu. Mom, uh, we wanted to interview him because he also had very interesting dealings with Mao. Um, and John said, shall we find somebody to introduce us? And I said, oh, John, you know, I've done two-month interviews. I'm exhausted. I'm going to the hair salon. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the hair salon. And ten minutes later, who but Mombuto started in? <laughs> and he was sitting, you know, like where Willie or the Erica is sitting. He was under this hair thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, he had bits of cotton walls around his head, bits of towels around his neck, and he was trapped. He had steam blowing into his hair. And when I was led to have my hair rinsed, I was able to pause in front of him and ask him for an interview. <laughs> and when you, we got it. <laughs> I mean, he never gave interviews, but um, we, we got into it. I guess that's slightly because I was um, in the, in the yes. hair salon. So I, I don't know how that answered the, the, the question, but anyway. Brilliant answer. It was, yeah, brilliant answer. It was meant to happen. You were meant to interview him. That cannot be organized. Have you ever written a book under a pseudonym? I've often wanted to. Yeah. Uh, and would you have chosen a male name? Never. Uh, I never would have, because I always thought that my role in part was to write the books about women that didn't yet exist, um, and, or that were lost, or that were burned by some mother or husband or sister. And if my older sister could have had her way, she would have burned all my books. Mm. Um, actually, 
there was a moment in my life when I was, um, there was a seminar at Columbia University in New York, my alma mater, where they were hailing fear of flying as a modern classic and who should stand up during the question period but my older sister, who said, I love Erica Jong very much, but she has ruined my life uh, with her books. And as a result, my life has been abominable, and I wish she had never written anything. So people just were sitting there and going, oh! there were five scholars from different parts of America talking about Fear of Flying and saying that why it was an important book and so on. And people just didn't know what to say when my sister said this. And there was a journalist from the New, New Yorker magazine there. And she came up to me at the interim, at the break, and she, the interval, and she said, uh, how do you interpret what your sister said? And I said, well, you know, every family has its insane members. <laughs> and mine is no different from anyone else's. I, I mean, I tried to make a joke of it because I was so shocked, not really shocked. I tell my writing students, never show your manuscript to your mother, your father, your <laughs> sister, your brother, or you will never finish it. Really, have you written anything under a pseudonym? Uh, only, when I was in Czechoslovak name? only when I was in Czechoslovakia as a young 20-year-old sort of ri novice writer, and that because I was there as a student, not a journalist, I used to write for the Sunday Times and the Guardian under the name Edward Dean. But I would <laughs> like to write a novel um, under a. Uh, but I would certainly choose a woman's name, something beautiful like Gloria, <laughs> or George Eliot. <laughs> that wouldn't quite work, would it? Okay, um, let's have a. Um, uh, no, you have to wait. Um, <laughs> let's have that one. He's waving with his fingers. Yeah, right on the aisle. Uh, question. Uh, about your Have you planted book, uh, a lot of questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Just ask the question. Okay, this is a very, so is a very your, intelligent audience. Okay, your early book, uh, Sideshow, uh, yes. I believe the title of Good, all right, next question. Of, uh, <laughs> That's very unfair. Protest. Uh, yeah, the girl there. The girl there. Okay. The girl there, you lost your chance. You mumbled. That was starting to be a very intelligent question. <laughs> All right, stand up, little girl. Sorry. Hi, Miss Chang. He's a tyrant. <laughs> you talked about that uh, you did not refrain from writing because of certain topics like death that hurts you and uh, because of the background of the Cultural Revolution and Miss, Miss Erica Jong, uh, you discussed the second wave of feminism in your book, The Fear of Flying. And Mr. Shawcross, you wrote a book regarding a strong woman, Queen Elizabeth, who survived widowhood. And my question is, um, how do you view vulnerability in women and, or, or vulnerability expected in women? Thank you. Mm. Vulnerability in women. Um, yeah, William, um, <laughs> you're, being <laughs> you're desperate to answer. The vulnerability of women. Well, I, I mean, of course women are vulnerable, some women, and so are some, perhaps many men, vulnerable. So I don't think it's a, something that is uh, peculiar to one gender or the other. Uh, but you're right that Queen Elizabeth was a very strong woman, and she survived. She, her husband died when she was 50, and she survived, astonishingly, another 50 years of widowhood. And the, the strength that, the, with which she did that, I, I hope I have shown in my book. And she did it. In her case, it came from the... Her, her mother, I think, who taught her, as she has taught our present queen, the, the three principles, love of family, love of country, love of God. I think those things inspired her. And uh, love but of the, gin. Well, that was good. <laughs> that certainly helped her, yes. But, um, uh, so I don't think I'm, I think the, the two what ladies the on this... What is the most vulnerable part of a woman? I, all I can say is... I, I have this tremendous admiration for Chinese women when I come here because of the immense strength which Chinese women do not attempt to cover up. Um, when, when my husband and I were in Beijing with some friends a few years ago, we had a, an official People's Republic guide. And I said to him, what is the situation of women in China? 
and he looked around. You know he was an official guide appointed by the government. I said, is there feminism in China? And he said, no, I think in China today we have wifeism. <laughs> and what he meant by it was that he felt that women, because they earned the same as men, because they had largely one child, not everyone, but many, um, were so liberated that they ruled the roost in every marriage. And I love that. Not feminism, but wifeism. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, talking about um, this vulnerability, I, my grandmother had bound feet. Um, her, you know, these so-called three-inch golden lilies, which basically made women, ma made it impossible for women to walk mm -hmm. properly. I mean, they titter. I mean, there was a Chinese expression, ruo liu ying feng, and, uh, which sort of basically compare men, the connoisseur of, of female beauty, compare this, this very vulnerable, you know, so you're about to fall all the time, like a willow being blown in the, in the wind. So they, they like that, I mean, like that in those days. So that they seem to inspire this sort of a protectiveness. Um, well, women were vulnerable in those days, and they are still very vulnerable in China today, even though they don't have bound feet, or the world, the world over. But my grandmother was immensely strong underneath. I mean, on those bound feet, I mean, she escaped, you know, I wrote in Wild Swans, with my mother, um, and, you know, an enormously difficult uh, situation. So, I mean, she was um, very, very strong. And then, of course, of course, women can also use their vulnerability to their advantage. I mean, my next book, David was just mentioning, is the Empress Dowager, Cixi Taihao. Um, she ruled China for decades until her death in 1908. I mean, she would use her vulnerability to inspire, um, you know, her subjects, the, the male officials. Um, you know, for example, after the Boxer Rebellion, she was driven out of Beijing. And whenever she saw a male official, she would burst into tears. And then because they, because they partially blamed her for the whole thing, and then they would, they would change their mind. They would feel protective towards her. They would forgive her. Um, and but, and of course, as they discovered to their peril, if they for, felt too protective, if they crossed a certain line, she would switch, she would change in the instant and made them, uh, made herself awesome, made, made, him, made herself fearsome. But of course, she was not hated by them. But she, she, she stopped uh, bound feet, didn't she? Yes, she is. That I had mentioned that actually she, she was a Manchu, so she escaped the torture of foot binding. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, she launched China's women's liberation. I mean, she, uh, she banned foot binding in 1902. Um, so, uh, so there well, it is. That's well, I, didn't, I didn't <laughs> never realized it was supposed to. Um, uh, evoke um, a willow in a train. I thought it was Chinese fetishism on, on, on small feet, but the <laughs> is. Um, okay, let's have another, uh, yeah, another man with a sort of beard here. Let's have a <laughs> dark fellow, yeah. Go on, you, it's yeah. Hilarious. No, no, not you, <laughs> sit down. No, in front, in front, yes, that one, yeah. Are you Indian? <laughs> <laughs> or Pakistan, or Chinese, I can't see. You're in the shade. No, not, no, you, in the black, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, sorry, my English is not as good as the other people. I'm well, not sure evidently, can... yes. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm not sure, can you understand my questions or not? Go on, um, ask the question. We spend a lot of time talking about the gender and the freedom. How about their money? Because for us money in good. Hong money. Kong, money. if you spend time to write a book, I don't think you can get enough money for your life or no, for <laughs> most of us. Um, right. I know Mr. Sir David Tang, you're rich enough for your life. 
but yeah, for how yes. other, how about you're rich the, enough for your life. Uh, yeah, you're rich enough. <laughs> How, How stupid the, can you be? How about Listen, the other guy? Okay, one minute. Well, it, it could be a serious question. I mean, I don't think it's peculiar to Hong Kong, but being a writer today, you can't expect to earn a living. Um, and, um, and yet, I mean, today you would go on writing a book, but not for money. You, you have already said it. Well, right? I've, been, I've been very fortunate in my life. When I first started to publish, I was getting these huge multi-million dollar advances, and, um, That's very fortunate. And, <laughs> and then when they stopped Indeed. coming, I had not spent all the money, uh, fortunately. I was prudent. And then when publishing changed, I was lucky enough to be married to a lawyer who makes a lot of money. <laughs> and so, there. whatever. Um, I mean, but life must know, changes, because... and we're afraid of change. We don't know the future, and we're afraid of the future. I mean, this is absurd. Well, you, you're very prudent, but, but I mean, I don't know whether you know, but you, you have had four husbands. <laughs> uh, number three was a Chinese husband. Yes. Uh, Born what's the a, real difference a between Cantonese. a Chinese husband and a Western husband? <laughs> yes. I, may, may I say that one Chinese husband does not permit one to generalize about all Chinese men. <laughs> but David, David pursuing, pursuing that line of questioning and um, following on from what um, Erica said about wifeism in China today, have you ever had a Chinese wife? I have had a Chinese wife. Have you? Yes. Is there any difference between Chinese, <laughs> Chinese and Western wives? There is absolutely no difference between a Chinese wife and a non-Chinese wife. They're both parasites. <laughs> oh, oh, God, David. No, I'm joking. All right, okay. Now, well, I'm joking. I, one I'm minute, one minute. Yes, Young, no. Yes. <laughs> parasites? I, when hardly. I wrote Wild Swans, I wasn't rich at all. I mean, well, I'm still not rich. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but, uh, but I, was, um, I was working, but I, I wrote in the evenings, I wrote in the we at the weekend. What I wanted to say is whether you can be a writer or not depends on just one thing, which is whether you desperately want right. to be a writer or not. If you are not desperate, I think you'd better not to be a writer. I and mean, you have to be, you know, now, now my criteria is I have only one week, one month to live. How do you want to spend this one, one mm -hmm. week? And I would say, I would go on writing. I mean, that is the thing I that totally gives me agree. the greatest pleasure. I mean, you have... <laughs> totally agree. The Canadian novelist Robertson Davies says, there is no point in writing a book unless you must, in, in, unless you must write that book or go mad, or perhaps die. Mm. Yes. Robertson Davies. Robertson Davies is a fine man. It's very fine sentiments. I would just like to say briefly, Samuel Johnson, the great British um, <laughs> philosopher and man of letters, said, only a blockhead would write except for money. <laughs> it's true. All right. Uh, but he was wrong. <laughs> yes, I think we've got to take a question at the back, which is a sort of Siberian yes, yes, section. All right, that girl, uh, that girl, uh, yes. Furious. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, three writers. And sometimes writers uh, hit them behind their books, and I'd like to know how uh, you identify yourself in your books, especially in some biographic and about yourselves and about your generation or some famous women or men. Thank you. Did anybody understand that question? <laughs> it was a very intelligent question, too intelligent for me. <laughs> All right, next. No, no. Okay, that man in a suit. He's the only man, he's the first one to speak with a suit on and a tie. You've discussed uh, or mentioned several times about um, the, the passion that one has to get out in writing and uh, earlier on mentioned Aesop and the need for people to tell stories. Um, what part of the equation when you set out to write a book is the need to affect change rather than satisfy a burning desire in your own 
personality or a story you just have to tell? And, well, and what change would you most like to be remembered for? Yeah. Well, I, I think, um, speaking for myself, I never wrote um, thinking I was going to change the world or, you know, to, for a political purpose. I think you write pamphlets for that. I mean, when you write a book, when I, speaking again for myself, and I write a book because I wanted to write this way and also because I want to tell a good story. And, of course, and at the back of your mind, I mean, taking the case of biography of Mao, and I didn't write it to change people's views and so on. I just wanted to tell the story about Mao, the, the truth, the true stories as we, we believe the truth, we discovered. But at the back of your mind, of course, there is, in the case of Wild Swans, it's a personal story, but um, in the history of China, is also at the back of your mind. Right. So I, my, the, for myself, I write to tell a good story, but I, was, I have always been conscious of, conscious of the, uh, the larger picture. Erica, well, I were you I, thinking of... Um, uh, uh, well, I, mean, I always believed, you know, I, one of the reasons I loved 18th century English literature was the satire and also because it was the great age of the feuilleton, and I al always thought that the word could change the world. Um, if you tell, if you tell truly what is happening to a character, um, and other people can identify with that feeling, you can really make the needle move. You don't always know the way it will make the needle move you don't know what the result will be. But one of the reasons I wrote was I did want to change the world, the relations between women and men, the ability of women to express themselves in ways that hadn't been possible before. That was part of my burning desire, and it still is part of my burning desire. Do you want to change the world, really? I, I think Jung, if I may answer this question differently, Jung is too modest. Her books did, whether she wanted mm -hmm. them to or not, her books on China, Wild Swans and her biography of Mao, did change the world in a very important way. It forbade us to have that ludicrous, damaging romanticism about Mao that so much of the Western world had mm -hmm. until her books came out, and she changed the minds of millions of people. And I think you know, that, that's those are sort of dreamy Andy Warhol portraits and things that existed right. in the 60s, the 70s, and 80s, and, and it's just absolutely awful. And she showed Mao to be as, as bad, if not worse, as Hitler and Stalin, and it's an incredibly important job that she did with her words. And, and very cruel, a very cruel man. A terrible, terrible tyrant. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a, another a little, not little, another important example of a young woman called Malala, who was yeah. a Pakistani, 16-year-old Pakistani girl who was shot at and by the Taliban who tried to murder her for her uh, espousing of girls' education in Pakistan and in uh, Afghanistan, and who was mercifully not murdered but very badly damaged. And, but, uh, but rescued by uh, uh, medicine in England. And she made an extraordinary speech to the United Nations mm -hmm. last week, which some of you may have seen, in which she said, one word, one book, one page, one person can change the world. And that young woman, I think, will do something extraordinary, is, is already doing something quite Absolutely. I mean, she also said that men are afraid of women's education in her speech at the UN, and I found that very moving. I mean, we have proven again and again in every report on the status of women that wherever women get the vote, become educated, can control their own health, the standard of living of the entire society goes up, Of course up, that's true, yes. Up. And the society prospers when women have education and freedom to choose how many or few children they will have. Um, it's, it's a truism. So a country that suppresses women and prevents them from getting an education is hurting itself more than anyone else. And that's the greatest catastrophe, or one of the greatest catastrophes of the entire Islamic world. Yes, I agree. Okay, um, let's have another... Yes, it was just frantically waving. The girl at the back, yes. <laughs> yes. In, a, in a crazy sort of hairstyle. <laughs> Let's hope you're 
question is intelligent. <laughs> I'll try not to disappoint. Um, this is mainly for Erica Jong because you've written explicitly about female sexuality, but I am interested in hearing everyone's um, thoughts. Um, though it's admittedly probably less now, um, it seems the world does female, I mean, does fear female sexuality quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, you've used your writing to challenge that. Um, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you think, um, this, where you think this fear stems from and how effective you think writing is in addressing it um, and sort of removing the taboo. That's really a tough question. Um, I think, I think it's, it's almost beyond my power, but there, there is a lot of fear in unfree men of female sexuality. Happily, there are men who, there are many men who have become feminists and who understand that a partner who is free is a better partner than one who is quaking in her boots and afraid to be beaten. Uh, there are many places in the world today where women cannot go out of the house with, to see a doctor without a male um, husband, brother. Um, I think, I'm thinking of Afghanistan where women die in childbirth because they cannot go to the doctor because of the terrain of the country and because their Taliban says that they will be shot if they don't go to the doctor with a male relative. Um, there are many places in the world where women are being raped, where men are being raped, for that matter. Where? Um, <laughs> in, in Africa. Um, I mean, if you've read the stories of the child soldiers and the various um, attempts to intimidate people, there are many places in the world where that is taking the form of power, of rape for power, rather than rape for sexuality. And we would all be, we would have a much more peaceful and happy world if we could get rid of rape as a weapon of power used against children, men, and women. Okay. Um, I've forgotten whether you answered the question or not, but anyway, let's go to another one. <laughs> Um, question. Yeah, in the front. We haven't had yes. one in the front. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. okay. Go on. Well, um, no matter you, whether you are writing uh, a novel, a uh, biography, or an autobiography, you are dealing with uh, characters. So, um, so my question C characters. is... Characters. Yeah, characters. Yes, yeah. Real or fake. So my question is about how much you would allow yourself to get into the book. So how much we can see you from the book? So it's actually about keeping the balance between subjectivities and objectivities and how much distance you will keep from your characters in the book. Well, it's a very... Very, very good question. Well, do you I think, think so? if you're a writer... <laughs> <laughs> good question. You good cannot... <laughs> Hi, very good. All right, okay. Uh, uh, Young I think it's a good I question. So you very, answer the well, question. Well, I think it's a very good question because, um, of course, while Swans is a personal story, I mean, there is my feelings, my, you know, my perspective <laughs> everywhere. I mean, you know, that. I mean, with, with our biography of Mao, we have been accused of lacking objectivity. <laughs> Um, I mean, people say I wrote the book to revenge uh, on Mao. I mean, to which my uh, answer about the revenge thing is there is nothing wrong with people trying to give, <laughs> uh, to get given, uh, get even with Mao, who's done so much damage to her life. But now, the book, I think, is objective in the sense that we constructed the story from all the facts we collected it. We, I mean, we changed our minds all the time. We kept an open mind. I think that's the, that, that is the, the measurement for me. Whether you kept an open mind when you approach your characters, whether you, 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 you collect the materials first and then form the, the characters at the end. Um, so I think it's objective. But, of course, not, no one, absolutely zero person, is not subjective. 
in writing a, a biography. I mean, you have to put yourself in it. There is judgment. I mean, whether you put it down on paper or whether you it's well at the back of your mind. So it's a, it's a, um, uh, so there is you in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the the people who uh, who writes allegedly um, objective um, books some academics say, well, actually, you know, it's just absolutely boring. You can't read it. I mean, there is no moral <laughs> dilemma. Um, there is no moral dimension. It's just um, people are not people. They are like matchsticks, um, like in a game. Um, there is no emotion. I mean, I don't want to read that sort of thing. I mean, I want to read the thing with the people, with your, your, your genuine, you know, authentic authentic and um, objectively formed characters. Do you think she is a candidate for the book? Yes. <laughs> for Definitely. Uh, for my book, for, for this, as being the most important book. might bear you in mind. Fair, Erica, you think I, so? I, uh, before I ask you, I'm going to ask the other biographer, because this, yes. th this is more relevant to being a biographer, being how you immerse yourself um, and, and how you distance yourself between objectivity and subjectivity, if in fact that means anything at all? I, th I think it's extremely hard. It's a very difficult, it's a very good question and it's a very difficult one to answer. And I think any biographer or non-fiction writer like myself who claimed to be completely objective and to be just a pane of glass through which the facts are passed, I think that's nonsense, it's impossible. And one has mm. to try and be conscious of one's own prejudices, mm. which I certainly have in scores, I'm afraid to say, and to try and limit them and to control them. And, but inevitably, the way in which one chooses the, which facts, which hundred facts out of mm. several thousand you can put on a page, it's, it's, it's bound to be subjective, and I think we all have to acknowledge mm. that. You just have to be disciplined, and it perhaps helps to have a forward to say what your point of view was when you started the book and whether it changed or not during the course of it. And of course, that's the luxury of a novelist, yes. right? In a way that um, you are not um, constrained by your, your subject, but inevitably you, you do can have make this. You can make things up, which is great. But I think <laughs> if you want to hide who you great. are, don't be a writer. Because however objective you think you are in your book, you reveal your entire personality by the selections you make, by the, the tone of the writing. Um, whether you're satirical, whether you're tragic, you know, it, it, it all comes through. So if you're afraid of self-revelation, the last thing you should do is be a writer. You should probably be an accountant or a stockbroker, <laughs> and you'll make a lot more money. I was passed this note by, um, by, <laughs> by, by, by really shockers. He says, David, do you fear female sexuality or love it? Um, I mean, I remember uh, going on a BBC question time once, and uh, I was asked a question right at the end. He says, do you, do you fear powerful women? And uh, I said, it depended whether they meant uh, women of influence or women with biceps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm afraid I feared both, which was the word I used earlier, uh, gynophobia. And, um, and in fact, I have a greater fear of women called vestmentophobia, which is the fear of beautiful women. So on that point, Michael Lynch, you've got a, um, a question. Uh, William, could I, just pick you, oh, sorry. could I just pick you up on your last point? Uh, uh, how's the West Carloon project yeah, Doing very well, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Why are you here? Your irresistible charm. Could, I do, could have do, not gone anywhere else. Do, my <laughs> last point, are you talking about female sexuality? No, I, no, I wanted to pick it, William. I'm just looking at your, that point you made about you know, the, when you've written the book, and I'm, I want to reference it back to the Murdoch book, whether looking at recent events and looking at the role that Murdoch and the family and News Corp have played in you know, the last two, three or four years, whether that's made you want to reassess any of the judgments that you made, any of the um, conclusions you came to in your book? Well, for those who don't know, but the, I wrote a biography of Murdoch, um, which happens to be here on this table, which came out 20 years ago, 1992, I think. And it was denounced by many of my liberal friends as being much too nice to him. 
And it was nice to him in the sense that most books about Murdoch written by my liberal friends and others had been denunciatory. And I thought this is an extraordinary businessman who would harness this, the information revolution in a remarkable way. And um, um, Erica said that he'd ruined television in Britain. Actually, I don't think that's true. Before tel Rupert Murdoch, we had um, four television channels. We now have Sky Television, which he created. And they, anybody, you've got about 60 or 80 channels, some of which are very, very good, others of which just show repeats and repeats and repeats, but then so does the BBC. Um, as but <laughs> to, your, to, your, to your question about recent <laughs> events, um, oh, he's, I imagine you're referring to the hacking scandals on the news of the world and so on in, in uh, the tabloid press in London. Or and divorce. <laughs> His divorce. Uh, are you referring to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was I can't believe you on the flow of sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> this is a marvellous chairman. I always want to appear with you, David, yeah, forever least, after. <laughs> most panels are so boring. I know, I know. There's nothing boring about David Tang, right. ever. <laughs> anyway... Um, the answer is, I mean, what was done at the News of the World in hacking uh, illegally was illegal and <laughs> therefore unforgivable. And uh, a lot of journalists have been arrested, scores of journalists, uh, maybe even over 100 journalists have been arrested. Supposed to be, I think, the biggest police operation in the last 40 years, which I think was some, somewhat overkill. Um, Murdoch has, I think, been very forward on this thing. Terrible mistakes were uh, happened. He hadn't paid enough attention to the leadership of the uh, newspaper operation in London. And uh, they've, they've paid a fantastic price, both in terms of journalists' lives and his chief um, woman, in, uh, uh, the chief, chief of staff, uh, his chief of operation officer, Rebecca Brooks, is a probably going to, is going to go on trial in November or September, I think, and probably go to jail. I don't know. So the price has been huge, and I think all the British press and tabloids, which have all indulged in these nefarious practices for decades, I think they will have to clean up their act, and they are doing so. But does it affect my basic opinion as Murdoch, as someone who has understood the power of the information revolution and harnessed it, and mm. brought enormous gains in television and press I mean, uh, to a lot of places like in India where Star Television is a huge success. And frankly, he there would be no British newspapers if he hadn't moved to Wapping in 1984 and saved the press from the tyranny of the unions. So I still think he's been, um, uh, on balance, a very good thing for the media. Well, he has but that's not a popular television in the United States and I don't gone think... and his book publishing operations are absolutely falling apart. Well, everybody's is. Yeah, no, HarperCollins is a very good house. Uh, every, for my last book with HarperCollins, I had six editors, each of whom was fired. I don't think that that's the way you run a publishing That's not good house. management, I agree. And I think mm -hmm. that there is no institutional memory. One editor after the other fell by the wayside. And whenever, when I went in for a meeting with my editors, they would all ask me where they should work next. <laughs> um, Trembling in their, your, book, uh, in their uh, boots, you, they would say, where do you think I should go next? Because this place is not a good place to work. Can I just quickly ask you, do you foresee any circumstances under which you might change your view about Mao, for example? Um, well, so far, not. Uh, no, unless... I can you imagine... Um, a circumstance um, in which uh, I, 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 well, I, my mind hasn't been spent uh, imagining about Mao. I mean, yeah. in fact, I put him behind now. I mean, now yeah. I, in the last uh, five, six years, I've been writing uh, the Empress Dowager, Tsi Shi. I mean, that only enhances my view that how awful he was, because people say he was just not a, just another Chinese emperor. Um, n not at all. I mean, there were Chinese emperors. Chinese emperors were not like that. I mean, earlier you mentioned Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor. I mean, Qin Shi Huang only burned, I say only burned, only burned a certain kind of books. I mean, you know, sort of Confucius <laughs> books. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but I mean, you know, I'm not defending him yet, yeah, but by the way, I mean, you know, but, but the I mean, anyway, I, I don't need to go on about that, but you probably you all know that. In 10 years, the books of general interest published in China 
could be counted on the fingers of your two hands,、yeah. and they were all there because they had they quoted Mao on every other page in bold. I mean that is the kind of cultural desert we lived、mm-hmm. in for ten years. But at the same time, Mao was a book lover. He his hobby was reading. His favorite hobby was to lie in bed reading. So he had these huge beds constructed for himself. Half the beds would be piled a foot high with books,、mm-hmm. so he could wake up, roll over. Pick up a book and start reading. I mean, the problem is he wouldn't allow one billion Chinese to read.、Mm-hmm. You think he would have read your biography? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if he had read our biography, I think he probably this. I I didn't imagine somebody asked this question, which I thought was a very good question,、uh, which is what would Mao have、prize? said?、Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mao, I, I think he、Next、would have said,、uh, "Well, you guys were smart. You got into my head because that's what we did. We spent twelve years, and we got into his head." Now I've got to tell everybody that we've only got、um, uh, seven or eight more minutes、uh, because time flies. So I'm going to take three last questions, and、uh, I'm going to take one from that man with the white hair,、uh, waving his left arm. Yes. First and then two more.、Um, we've heard the importance of imagination and no、uh, earnest and diligence, <laughs> yes, and passion、um, and uh, uh, diligent research. But I wonder about the importance of feedback on your writing. And、um, could the panel say what the what they've learned most,、uh, or what the, the single most important thing they've learned from a review? And what's the worst、uh, thing that anyone has said about them in a review? <laughs> well, I, there's a famous story of the man who had a, a book reviewed and he was absolutely plastered. And、um, he wrote to the reviewer. He said, "Dear so and so," he said,、um, "At the moment, I'm in the smallest room in my house.、Um, I've got your review in front of me. Very soon, it will be behind me." <laughs> Really, have you had a have a bad review?、Uh, yeah, I tend. If someone rings me up and said, "God, that person's given you a real stinking review," I tend not to read it. Very good, Very Erica. Good. Do you read bad、um, reviews? You know what happens is that you you vow not to read them, and then your best friends say, "Why on earth did Paul Theroux call you a mammoth pudenda in the New Statesman?" <laughs> And that—that that is a giant cunt. That is how I was reviewed in the New Statesman in 1974. She is nothing but a giant cunt,、uh, roomy as the Carlsbad caverns, luring amorous spelunkers、uh, to whatever. You clearly read this review. I, <laughs> you memorize these bad reviews, and in the depths of depression. That's why you couldn't read them. And despair. When you are suffering from writer's block, <laughs> you remember everyone. Yeah, the,、uh, what do you, <laughs> how do you treat bad、that. reviews? I, treat, I never do. <laughs> how do I treat bad reviews? Well, I mean, actually, with our Mao biography, I mean, well, I got extremely few bad reviews with Wild Swans, so that was I was very, very lucky.、Um, and with Mao, we we had、um, a fair amount of bad reviews.、Um, I mean, let's not. Uh, uh, oh, uh, let you, uh, mainly from.、Uh, um, Or if I may say, die-hard Maoists, <laughs>、um, or people,、um, you know, academics who probably.、Um, anyway, I, let's not attribute motives. Well, what I, what I, how I treat them is when, when I think I must say when they first came out,、um, I tend not to want to read it,、um, mm-hmm. but but then I decided to read it. And then I got tremendous pleasure out of them, because I I then realized that,、um, they don't not one of them have put up have have said you got this wrong you got that wrong、mm-hmm. you got that wrong. I mean I from two o o five to now I have yet to 
I have I've yet to have one person, one bad reviewer, to come forward and say we got a certain fact, a, a, a single right. fact wrong. I mean, we. That's right. I mean, they that's, never teach you anything we at all except their prejudices. For. We Absolutely. were so careful, and uh. th there were people who set up websites for other people to find faults with our book. Um, and put in that website, and that website had remained empty. Um, <laughs> and, and if I, I, if I one big um, criticism of our Mao book, uh, which I thought was so incredible, was this, I don't know whether you know about this myth during the long march between 1934 and 1975. The Red Army was supposed to have crossed this bridge over 100 meters long, and the bridge was supposed to be set on fire, all the planks removed, the nationalists were machine gunning them, and yet they crawled on the bare chain over, over this bridge, you know, over chasms and so on, without a single casualty, without anyone even have a scratch. And I just thought, when we were writing the Mao book, I thought it only warrant a, a footnote. I don't think, I didn't think anyone with any, uh, with, with, uh, you know, my, with, in their right mind would believe this could be true. But John, who knows the world, and said, oh, no, 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 this story is very important. It's on the book, uh, on the cover of all these books about uh, the, the communists. Um, I mean, indeed, it is so important. It's on, if you Google uh, our Mao book, uh, one, one uh, whole um, section is named after this bridge. I mean, so many people attacked us for, oh, oh how dare they attack you, saying that this story is not true, it's myth. But, of course, wonderful uh, things uh, that people came to supporting us. And the most encouraging thing is somebody then dug out what Deng Xiaoping said to Brzezinski, who's Carter's national security advisor, who, was in, in, who saw Deng. And even Brzezinski went to see this bridge, this site, this heroism of, com, of, communism, of communists. And Brzezinski then said to Deng, oh, I saw this famous Dadu bridge. I mean, you know, um, I was so bowed over, and Deng said, it's all a fake. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for, we, we invented it for propaganda purposes to boost our morale. Mm -hmm. I mean, that silenced the... Uh, the uh, Mind you, Brzezinski, if I remember his face, he had very narrow eyes uh, yes. between his, um, his nose. Brzezinski? Yeah, so he probably didn't see it properly. <laughs> um, okay, second last question. Um, there's an intelligent looking man here. Um, on a second row. Is, is, he, a friend IP, of, is he a friend of yours? Yeah. No. <laughs> second last question. Uh, just a quick uh, comment on the Dr. Zhang's your uh, comment about the picture of Mao with the books in the, uh, on his bed. Mm -hmm. Actually, that picture was released right after the arrest of the Gang of Four. I think the Xinhua message behind that picture was that Mao had not been sleeping with Jiang Qing. Because, uh, <laughs> yes. In order to separate Jiang Qing from uh, Mao, yeah. That, that, that's the message that's behind the that picture, actually. It's not so much about Mao's love of books. Love. Uh, uh, my, my, my question, however, is uh, first of all, uh, thank you for bringing in this wonderful lineup, the four of you. It's like as perfect as a string quartet. Because we have a man here writing about a mo woman's biography, and then a woman there writing about a man's biography, and then Miss Jung writing about uh, feminism, and uh, Sir David writing about yourself. Yeah. So, <laughs> Whee! Right, enough. Next question. No, my, that is, that is no more. Right, that the, is the, much the, the, best the, the woman in the aisle. Yeah, this one. Yeah, well, very good. Really not have impertinence uh, permeating the air. I don't know. No, okay, so. uh, Mr. Shawcross yeah. has written a book uh, on the Shah of Iran, and uh, Ms. Jung, you plan to write a book about a French woman painter. So, uh, Dr. Zhang, how about you? Uh, you have any plan to write something about non-Chinese subject? Since you've been living in England for such a long, a long time. time, how about um, Kate Middleton or maybe that baby? <laughs> oh, do be sensible, no. right? That is, that is. No, all right. No, if you want. No is the answer, right? We've got two more minutes. 
right at the back, uh, the, the girl with the red dress. Yes, yes. Uh, second last question. Kate Middleton, do be sensible. <laughs> We've spent quite a lot of time talking about how Mao was even worse than any of us suspected. And um, to Mr. Shawcross's point that Ms. Jung's Miss Chang, sorry, book opened a lot of our eyes to this fact. And I'm very interested, um, Sir David, that you asked her if anything would change her mind because I'm actually wondering whether Ms. Chang's book might change your mind about stocking all of the Mao-themed merchandise in Shanghai Tang. That's a very good question. That is the most intelligent question today. David, I wonder... You know, no, no, but, but the, I, I, I endorse Thank you. Thank <laughs> David you. and the, this merchandise. I mean, because they are not, it's not about uh, Mao has become, become an art subject or he's, he's become something to, uh, you, you know, you can say anything with. You can praise him, you can, you can ridicule him. I mean, he is not there to, uh, to inflict damage on us. Thank and you. that is the thing uh, I... But, but can I just say three things? Number one, Shanghai Tang was established before your biography. <laughs> you, you could... Number two, inevitably, <laughs> whatever you think, it is part of the entrenched culture, the cultural culture of China in the last 60 years, and he's still, his portrait still hangs in Tiananmen Square, that's and right. we were merely reflecting the culture of the age, because that's what fashion is, if you don't understand it. Number three, I sold all my shares, or practically all my shares, in 2006, so your question is irrelevant, and you should be asking the South African who now owns it, run by a <laughs> Frenchman, and uh, run by other people, so um, you're not getting the book. <laughs> Last question. All right, we'll, we'll let that bald man who interrupted us um, first... <laughs> To have the final say. That's very yeah. So David is a man of his word. Um, this is likely to be an idiot of a question because I have a confession to start with. I haven't read a novel, and a work of fiction, since about 1993 or 4. Um, and yet I'm here. Um, and that was really, I think, because the last thing I re read was a series of Ayn Rand novels. <laughs> And I thought, I felt I'd got all the fiction I needed for the rest of my life. Um, the other thing was that I have such a, an imagination that I didn't really think I needed any stimulation, dangerous <laughs> enough on my own. Um, and finally, of course, um, talking of uh, Ms. Jong's views about not seeing the future presciently, of course, now we don't need any fiction. All we do is read the post every morning. We get enough of that every day. Now, but back to my question, and that is, um, seriously, um, Ms. Jong, I mean, uh, the result was I, I actually bought one of your books. I mean, the book, of course, Fear of Flying, and I'm up to 30%, my e-book reader tells me. I can't do the page, which is very unfortunate. Um, but um, uh, there's a word that comes to, springs to mind instantly in reading your work, brutality. The same sort of brutality I get from your book as I got from our Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand. And I'm very curious as to what reaction you might have to that view. I mean, is it the, it's that brutality which is, it's also that thing I read, you, you wrote about you know, peeling off the masks and, and then being, I don't okay, know enough. what you were saying. Are you I said Australian? enough, right? So I think you know... The Are you Australian? Uh, originally, but I've been here for 34 years. Exactly. So I'm, I'm a Hong Kong, yeah. thank you very well, much. Exactly. Long live Hong Kong. All you understand is brutality. Anyway... Uh, America. There, That's not true w, of Australians. W. H. Auden used to quote um, an author who many believe he made up. Um, and this author said, a book is like a mirror. If an ass peers into it, you can't expect an apostle to look out. <laughs> so I would say that you, we all tend to see in books a reflection of ourselves, which perhaps the author didn't put there. Mm -hmm. All right, well, look, um, <laughs> on that note, uh, I'm afraid uh, two hours, of, almost two hours have gone, and um, I just want to thank 
all of you for coming and possibly I might just ask my panel which question they think <laughs> might have been the most intelligent question of the evening. Um, really? I like two questions. I like the one praising you for coming towards him, <laughs> <laughs> saying that you were the most ent entertaining because you were writing about yourself. And I also like the question about female sexuality, inevitably. Uh, who, who, who asked a female sexuality question? Who? Well, hold up your hand. Okay, right. Okay, that one there. Erica, which one do you think? I, I think it's very interesting to talk about the fear of female sexuality, which takes many, many forms in our world. Um, so do you think she might have... Geni asked? Genital mutilation, shooting Malala and her, her yeah, cohort, okay. blah, Hold blah, on. blah. <laughs> so I think, it's, not I think it's a really good question. That, that woman there. Yes. Yeah. That uh, woman there. Well, I, that, yeah, right. that woman. I, I, did, not, I know, did not have sex, sex with, with that, that woman, woman Miss... Lewinsky. Not, yes, yes. Right. Yes. I, I met <laughs> Lewinsky once. I had a very good conversation with her. Um, and I did not have sexual relations with her either. <laughs> uh, you know, which, uh, was there any particularly good... Did you think that that question from the third row of that girl about getting into the character and so forth was, in your mind, the most intelligent? It's a very good yes. question, Yes. yes. Well, I don't believe in democracy, so unless there was unanimity, I'm going to keep my book for tomorrow's session at the Hong Kong <laughs> University. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Right. And um, if you want that to win the book, you have to come. It. We have one more session at Hong Kong University tomorrow, and thank you very much again for coming. I hope that you will return next year which will be the 25th anniversary of the book fair. And um, I have how promised uh, the Trade Development Council to bring uh, uh, some more interesting authors. Uh, and I'm better authors, you mean? <laughs> much, more, much more interesting, is that what you mean? <laughs> and I want to thank the TDC again and the book fair and, of course, our panelists for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.